All right. Okay, so this is the first uh, Serious Squash podcast, and actually, um, he doesn't know it yet, but he's going to help me pick the name for the, the podcast. Um, so lots of pressure on uh, our first guest. Um, so he's probably coached more juniors in Canada than anybody in the past uh, 30 years. Uh, I worked with him for a year before going to Western, uh, see if anyone can guess who I'm speaking about yet, but he got his start uh, coaching around uh, 1978 in Montreal, and then by 1984 uh, was coaching in Toronto, uh, where he's still residing and coaching at the, as uh, the head coach at the Executive Squash and Fitness Club. Uh, that's the club that uh, I worked at uh, him with a year. Uh, it's uh, none other than uh, Rob Brooks, who and my uh, time knowing him from when I was a junior and also uh, working with him, and I think everyone else who's uh, worked uh, worked under him or been coached by him knows that he's you know, extremely hardworking, humble, uh, selfless, and caring, passionate, very dedicated about squash. Uh, he's in the Squash Ontario Hall of Fame, and uh, uh, not yet probably in the Squash Canada one, but I'm sure that's uh, coming soon someday. Um, and uh, Obviously, I thought it would be a perfect per person to come on the, the podcast with me and just discuss um, his experience with junior squash and uh, share some of his knowledge with other coaches and other juniors and, and some of their parents even uh, to help get a good uh, perspective on, um, you know, everything he's gone through. And, and I'm sure we could all be better off, uh, you know, from some of the um, information he'll get, um, we'll go into today. And it's not going to be necessarily a... Uh, biographical just uh, look back in Rob's uh, past it's going to be more about uh, him kind of answering some questions that I think are really interesting about squash and um, yeah I hope you find them these uh, questions and answers uh, interesting as well so Rob welcome and uh, I don't did I mess any anything up there or did I get no, that I, yeah, right? you did it better than I gave it to you <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, <laughs> Well, some of that I already knew. So I, I you know, I obviously had a bit of a background um, as playing at Pine Valley as a junior and then again, uh, working with you. Um, I think that would have been about 2004 or so before I went to Western. Uh, so that was a while ago. Yeah. yeah, it would have been right around there, maybe yeah. a little later. So I, I guess the, the first question I want to ask you is still going to be about uh, you're starting up as a coach and if you had a mentor uh, or someone who kind of taught you how to how to coach and um, kind of who ignited that passion for you um, as, to get into squash. Well, there were two things I always liked to do at growing up and going to university. I love sports and I love to read. And uh, so I wasn't sort of interested in the financial, looking for a job financially that would be a big payoff or anything. I wanted to do something I liked. So I majored in English and I read some fabulous literature and I uh, loved all sports. So when I graduated from Dartmouth, I had a I I could either teach or get into sports somehow, but uh, the thing that changed my life was going to Jersey City, which is where the Statue of Liberty is, when that's where a lot of the juniors now are in New York City, going to Columbia and in, into the schools. But uh, I just uh, I'm. Uh, I, I, I felt I wanted to teach. And I went back to Jersey City where I had done a term teaching to get my sort of degree in education. And I just fell in love with kids and families. And I, uh, this was an area where uh, there were two areas in the U.S., Compton, California, and Jersey City were two of the least, uh, it was a very low income and people were needed to help get these areas going. And Dartmouth had a program there. So I realized very early on, if, if kids understand and their parents understand that you're not just there 
to to be the you know the sort of somebody who wants a degree or something. I love that situation. I was teaching in the school, uh, and I was uh, tutoring. So I'd get up in the morning at six, have breakfast, go into the school till three thirty, come back four to six. We tutored in our home from for where we were staying. It was called the Dartmouth House, and all this came together. And I decided I would look to go into teaching, which I did, but I couldn't do it right away because they didn't have an opening down there in Jersey City. But in the in second year, I got back down there and uh, got going. And uh, that sort of led to, uh, I sort of it found out that New York City, I loved it, and I would go in and take advantage of all the things. I'd be knocked on on my door where I lived when I was uh, teaching. Uh, I did teach one year after I left Jersey City as a Dartmouth student, and uh, they would knock on the door, Mr. Brooks, do you want to come out and play basketball? on the weekend. So I, I just was immersed totally in the kids. So that, when, when did you get into squash then? Was it, how did you transition the, from the teaching to the, to, to squash specifically? Squash came along with uh, the Montreal. That was a transition. So I had been in, in uh, teaching in Jersey city. That, that's the teaching part. And then when I came out of that teaching part, I just, New York City, I just didn't feel comfortable being in that environment. I'm more, I went to a Dartmouth, which you know because of the tournaments we went to there, that it's very rural, just a lot of space. And uh, that, that sort of helped, the Montreal situation was, and I was staying with my sister and brother-in-law for a while, and then I got my own place and stayed through uh, they moved to uh, Toronto 79. I came to Toronto in about uh, 84, I think. And that's where my, I got my job from uh, uh, in, in teaching squash. Okay. Um, so I want to get into the actually, uh, into the actually squash kind of uh, theory and, um, some of your experience with coaching since that time. So one of the things that I'm, I'm always curious about is how squash has evolved. And obviously there's been lots of changes to the, you know, the rules, even having hardball, softball, single dot, double dot, like there's been a lot of changes. So, but how, how have you noticed squash changing um, just the style of play or even as a coach from when you were, you know, starting out or, or even the early days at Pine Valley compared to nowadays? Well, I think nowadays the, the players are are just so much better than they used to be because there's it's a totally world game now. There's so many good coaches out there. When I I attended a, a like an hour and a half almost a, a Broadway play in Montreal with uh, Jonah Barrington doing a one man clinic and and you know Jonah is quite a, a an amazing guy and if you if you ever are in his company for over an hour you'll love and that's the softball game it was transitioning from hardball to softball and softball suited me more i'm very plodding and very i'm not my hands aren't that quick but i'm determined and I would be very, very patient. And that game really w was what I wanted to play, the softball game. Um, so what area of the game, either uh, previous or present, do you find is the most difficult to teach somebody? And most, I'm gonna say for juniors, we're gonna focus mostly on the junior aspect here. Okay, on the juniors, I think you're always looking for some connection that would make them want to play. So it's not, you know, otherwise maybe some parent has just brought them over and they're not really sure what they're doing. 
So that, that opportunity, the parents may have known what they were doing, but I, you need to make a connection somehow. You know, uh, I had one story once where one little fella, he was four or five and he was, you know, not really uh, playing. He, he was a brand new player and uh, he wasn't really into it. But one day he came to class with a jump rope. And uh, I said, are, are you a good jump roper? Because I've always wanted to learn how to jump rope and I can't even do one <laughs> turn. So I said, if you teach me to jump rope, uh, you would, would you then let me teach you squash? Because he wasn't really into it. So you're always looking for something to get started. Do you know what I mean? Because it's often parents who play the game and love it, but maybe, you know, with juniors, they're, they're not sure about it. So is the hardest, I would, well, I think ahead. that's what you're probably the best at, right? Is actually being able to like uh, ignite somebody's passion for the game. And then, I, I mean, that's what I feel as a coach is if you don't do that, that. you can't do anything with them, right? It doesn't matter what you do. So Right. Yeah. You could be the number one in the world, but, uh, you know, you've got to make a connection or you're not going to be able to do anything for them. Okay. I have a couple um, um, little different questions here, but I want to also talk about the parents. So do you, uh, do you find it um, distracting at all if parents are watching – uh, their children take a lesson. Is that, or do you have an issue with that at all, or not? Does it depend on the parent or the? Teacher? I've never, I've never been one that said the the parents can't stay and watch. I've always that's been, but I've found in the last five years because of the technology, they're filming your lessons, which may be very good, but it distracting. I'm not distracted because when I'm in the court, the one thing I've always done is I don't look at the clock. I almost know automatically what 40 minutes is. And I usually will go over unless I've got somebody waiting for the next one, which can happen. But I, I never want to be looking at the clock. And I'm sure you as a coach, or there are sometimes you can tell people are, they're giving you maybe a great lesson, but they're not engaged with who they're talking to. Okay. Yep. You know what I mean? And yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, I don't mind a parent being there and look because I learned a lot by just when Mike Radcliffe was playing with some of the players in Montreal that were world class, he'd tell me, look, just come by and watch. Yeah. Um, okay, I, another one about the parents here. So if you're at a tournament, what do you feel is appropriate uh, for a parent to be saying or cheering between rallies? Because obviously sometimes they're the most involved in the, in the stands and they mean well, but sometimes things slip out and, uh, you know, the, the, Jimmy on the court doesn't always want to hear, you know, the parent's voice just sticks out like, you know, uh, so sometimes what they say or don't say can actually really impact the match. Yeah, and I don't think, obviously, they're not doing it to hurt their child, but I always try to say to them, look, why don't you watch the sport for the beauty of what your, your child is showing you on the court? And don't argue calls. Parents should not argue calls. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, you'll hear them say, yeah, but it was just such an awful call. Let your teach, I would teach my juniors, if they have an issue, they should address the referee, make their point, but if they, they, they can't change the call unless the ref will. And if you're the better player, that's the beauty of squash, you're gonna win 99% of your matches if you're the better player. If it's pretty close, Anything could happen, and it's a yeah. human elements in it in roughing. Uh, so, so another couple of uh, parenting questions. So how do you deal with a parent that's maybe, that you know, they use that term helicopter parent or a difficult parent or somebody who's maybe too involved um, and maybe disrupting their child? Do you, have you had, I'm, I'm sure you've had a, a few experiences with that over the years. Well, it, when we, you went down to University of Pennsylvania with us, did you? 
Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah. That was so much fun because we went and uh, Squash Ontario instigated that through the uh, Jamie and uh, uh, the whole Squash Ontario. They take the bus down to the U.S. Open, which prevents leaving early. Yep. Because the best matches are the last day. And when you and I were going down, we, off, we often dominated because we were playing softball earlier than the U.S. Yeah. But, um, you know, it, it, it's the parents, when they went on the bus, too, they wanted to watch the best matches. Yeah. So it's, it's just learning to love your sport. Because we were lucky that we were there till the end all the time because we had enough people in the finals or third or cons finals. Cons finals matches we were sort of the, the valley of death because you might get eight, eight matches in a tournament or seven matches in a tournament. And the early morning matches too. <laughs> yes. Especially for the, the lower age groups. If you ever heard crying or yelling, it was you normally cramping in the last day to try to get fifth place. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe you uh, you're such a good uh, communicator, and you know I think the parents maybe know how well you you mean for the 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 child that you don't have as much uh, problem as maybe some a few coaches probably have with parents that are really difficult to talk to, and maybe you know, they kind of want it more for the kids than the kids themselves. Like that's, you know, I've had a few issues with that over the years and that's a difficult conversation to have and something you can't always change. Yeah, I think a little thing, Ian, when we were talking, when you had told me, Ian said, you know, Rob, you should just uh, uh, remind, uh, I'm, I'm, I've lost my train of thought here for a second, but uh, it was, uh, Oh, when you came back from the tournaments, often the parents would nowadays won't have them play house league on Monday night. Okay. Right? When you guys came back, I would always say, no matter who you're playing, and even if you're tired, you're probably, it's going to be easier for you to win. Yeah. If you want to win, don't cancel because you're tired because you've just played some great squash, Can't take Tuesday off, not the Monday night, which is traditionally house league nights, right? And I remember actually as a kid, they would let me in Ontario play two divisions. So I would play like, you know, under 12, oh, under 14. So I, I would have double the matches and then I'd I know. play. You know. And you'd come out for the, the match unless you were injured, but yeah. even you, you're, nobody's ever 100% in squash. Yeah, and that's also when the scoring was different. So it, it was longer points and longer right. matches and rallies. So it wasn't as, you know, maybe short and, and lopsided as some of the matches are these days. But yeah. um, so I think I have one more kind of parent, uh, well, not really parent, but adult kind of slash junior. I know you always uh, found it really important to have juniors competing against adults. So why do you, why do you find that such an important part for a junior? Well, because of what my background was, if I hadn't had people like when I was in my 20s learning the game, 18 to, no, 20, 21 to 30, let's say, it was all the, the people in that age group of, 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 let's say, 40 to 60 that would be members of a club. So I would be taking lessons from Mike Radcliffe, the pro that taught me the game, and he was my go-to guy. But these guys were usually the best tennis players in the summer in Montreal, but in the winter they'd go to squash, softball squash, and they were the best softball players in squash, not the guys that just played squash. And that I found very, uh, uh, very interesting. So that showed me that tennis is a very skilled game. And the guys that, but why would they, they, they didn't want to play tennis inside. And I agree, I think tennis is an outdoor game. It's just meant to be that way. And, uh, but with the, and they are, unless it's raining, like at Wimbledon, they put the roof over eventually. But yeah. uh, 
tennis is an outdoor game. Squash is an indoor game. So, but how did you get, uh, like, I know in your house leagues, you would always have like maybe one quarter, one third of the people would be juniors and some adults ne don't necessarily like losing to a little kid uh, and they wouldn't feel like they could play like their own game or be comfortable. Um, and, uh, you know, so did, how, like, do you, how did you come up with that idea where it would just be anyone plays anyone, regardless of your age or gender? Uh, it was all based on skill level. Okay, with that, now this, you've refreshed my memory. When I left uh, Wingfield, when we had to, when the owner died, and I took all, most of the people from our club there at Wingfield went up to Steeles West, Partners West, that became Pine Valley under my name when we owned it for about 10 years. And uh, what uh, I said to them as the old group was leaving and just introducing me to help me get started because I'm gonna take over the next day. I said to them that night, I said, the one thing I will always do is there will be juniors playing in everything, it's, but it's by a level. So in other words, if, if Chris Annabury is a top player and he's 10 years old and you're 50 years old, you're going to be playing them. And that, that's not negotiable, you know, because I needed that 50 year old and, mo you know, good. If they're that good, they were easier because they love to coach or help young kids. But yeah. some of the, just the regular adults who were intermediate or, or uh, low b intermediate, I said to them, you will realize later that now playing with those youngsters it keeps you young, but they are embarrassed to lose. That's the, what I felt. But yeah. that couldn't be negotiable. I said, you don't have to leave the club. We have plenty of other places where you can get help. But Helsley, if Brad Hanabury, who was younger than you, Chris, and <laughs> if he's as equal to his brother, you're going to have two Hanaburys eventually in the one position. Well, I feel like he, ne he never got over the Jim White hurdle. So I don't know if it, uh, <laughs> he's still working his way up there. <laughs> well, he eventually did. He eventually <laughs> yeah. did, yeah. I'm sure. I think he still has a losing record, though. Well, <laughs> he was a late bloomer. <laughs> yeah. So I have uh, a bit more junior focused. Uh, so we'll kind of leave the adult and, and okay. section. But uh, what, what qualities do you find makes a junior uh, – coachable what what do you find is the most important kind of characteristics I can tell when when I, I I would give a lot of lessons when I was younger because I also kept the price very low which would make me very tired when I'd go home at night because I might do a number I was knocking off a lot of lessons but I loved it I always thought in my lessons I would pick the things I want them skill-wise get better at, but I always wanted to play them a little bit within the lesson to move them around the court and see what type of pressure they could put on me. Because almost every junior I ever taught that, you know, goes to all the tournaments and stuff, and there have been a lot of them, and it's not just me, they had other coaches too at the same time but you can tell how they're coming along. And what I would do is not try to ever beat them, but I'd never let them beat me. So I wanted them to use me as a bar and almost you pass me, all these guys pass me. That we used to drive around to all the Ontario tournaments, the go to Montreal we went to, where Brad never got his bike. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was Ottawa, actually. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. But close, close to uh, yeah. Uh, Quebec. Yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah you're right. It's, yeah, it was on the board. It up recently. <laughs> <laughs> he he was wondering, he's wondering if it's going to be a vintage bike now. So, <laughs> uh, so um, well, yeah. I was going to ask, so what age do you think is the right age for a junior to start competing and playing tournaments? Because I know it's only a couple of years ago. Squash Canada introduced an under uh, 
11, I believe, for nationals, but I know other countries have had under 11 for ages. There's even a few countries that do under nine. So what age do you think is the right age uh, for juniors to start playing tournaments? Well, I think when we started playing, we would have Jim Patton had a program, a huge one, Munchkins. And he had a ton of Munchkins and those Munchkins won a lot of titles when they got older. Yeah. It's just, if they're, they, they will determine whether they can do it or not. I mean, if they're crying on the court or they're, they're not happy, you just have to say, delay this a bit. But I think now we're back to under nine now in silver events and Grand Prix events. Okay. So it's been, remember, it used to be under 14, 16, 17, and 19. Yep. And then we started to get it under 12, but now it's even under nine. See, so because, because of the world, there are more better coaches in every place. And it's just, it's just the coach has to make sure that you don't let them start if they're not ready. Yeah. Take them on to let them see it, but just let them come in and hit around. Yeah, I mean, I've always been for the early tournament play, but I also feel like as long as the kids don't become just uh, one sport minded. If you're eight oh, I agree. and you're only playing squash, that's that's not right. But I think if they're doing squash in two or three or four other sports and playing a few tournaments, I think that's great. So, I do too. And yeah. tennis, tennis can help. A lot of the top uh, European uh, squash players were also tennis players. Yeah. Like, you know, at that time. And that te uh, tennis teaches you to volley more too, as does doubles play in squash. So, so another, another junior question is, um, obviously there's differences between coaching boys and girls. What do you find is the biggest general difference? I feel the the girls mature maybe a little faster in terms of taking if they really want to play they are there for the, the guys are a little bit uh, you know they're just big they just like to play and they're they we were we were all goofs as boys the girls if they really wanted to play those they were in trouble if they were playing a boy at uh, you know under 16 under 17 if they were matched up it was a war and yeah. it could be because the guys but the guys learn to appreciate that and I, one thing I've always said to parents I said if if your child brings home someone that they're interested in take let's say they uh, you have a daughter and she comes home and says, I'm bringing my boyfriend. You should go and watch them play. If that guy, your son, is whining because his girlfriend <laughs> that he brought home is beating uh, him, that's not a good sign. Because squash players, if, if <coughs> someone's a good squash player, they're at, it's lovely to see someone that can play that well. Yeah. They shouldn't be crying. They shouldn't be doing all that stuff. It's a sign. It's a good sign if they like that. No, yeah, well, it's a sign of a lot of dedication and, uh, yes. you know, effort Respect. and passion, I think, to get to that level and be at that, that point. Um, so I have, I have a couple, like, uh, competitive uh, questions here. So I was just curious if there's something typically you like to say to a junior before they go out and play in a match. And it could be, you know, at a league match, it could be at maybe the Canadian Junior Open or anywhere. Like, what would you like to say typically in a pre-game match before they play? I, well, I sort of want them to understand, and I'll sort of coach them on that. Don't worry about winning or losing. Go through what you've been working on. And don't worry about winning or losing. One person's going to win, one's going to lose. So just enjoy the battle and uh, come back and work on it in house league or with your friends. But uh, I encouraged a lot. We did our summer camps, as you know, and we never did it boy, girl. It was, it was level. 
Yeah. So yeah. you might, we might, we, at that point, there were probably more boys playing than girls, but sometimes the girls, some of the top players in the boys and girls were girls combined. Yep. So it's just maturity. It's just, uh, but you don't want to discourage, you don't want to lose anyone because there are, there are sleepers that don't develop till maybe 16, 17, 18 in terms of, okay, I'm committing now. And there are a lot of young girls and boys that committed at seven, eight, nine. And they obviously, if they loved it, they had a little advantage. But in the end, it evens out. Yeah. It's the work you put in and the love of the game. Well, I think if you, yeah, I mean, everybody wants to win, but I think if that's the only goal that you just put a bit of pressure on yourself, like unnecessarily. So when we went down to the U S and to the, well, uh, Ontario's or, or Quebec or stuff for tournaments, I would always say the first time I, if I had somebody who had never been to that level, I'd say, do not, worry about winning or losing do your best and learn from every match because if you can win a match you're going to get extra matches but you you probably are going to just be first time you're doing this even though you're a good player but you've never done it before it's going to be hard yeah so don't come in there thinking you're going to uh you know, wipe the table with everybody. You're not. So what would you say between games to a junior generally? Basically, again, depending on like, if I, if I were coaching someone like you or Brad, I would be looking if I saw any patterns to your opponent's play once you entered the court, seeing if, um, you know, I could pick out one thing. My, I often say to people, my people, at some point in a match, you could hit your opponent with a serve. And you might pick a special time to do it. Because if you do it near the end of a game, uh, it, it can turn it because they get so frustrated. And that's not a bad thing to try to do it's their job to move or call a ladder whatever they're going to do but often i just want them to be thinking the whole match because i and i i would often say to them try it once in a match and very often when they came out they'd be smiling and say i hit them yeah (laughs) yeah right yeah so it makes their it makes them smiling and happy whether they won that game or match didn't matter but think think well I think that's a good way to make them really engaged and show that they're present and uh, I think most kids like something that's clever where they're like oh look at that sneaky little way I want to rally there so but I know one way one thing you're really good at I've seen you at many tournaments where you you know you you know you really take time to talk to the athlete after a match um, you yes. have a ton of athletes. So what, what is something you would say to somebody after the match? Um, and would that, would the timing of that, would that change depending if, you know, some people are really angry, they just don't want to talk to anyone. So does, yeah. that, does the result matter or would you wait longer? No, they- well, it depended on the person, okay. the person and I, but if somebody was one who was crying when they came off the court, I've just got to let them go a bit unless, uh, you know, it, it's not going to do any good right then. But I will go back, let's say, let's say I've got one, a match after the one that the guy lost and cried or the girl lost and cried. But I'll go back after the next match and talk to them. Because you don't want to get them, you know, over, you know, it's over now. Take, I just say, take some time and that's it. Unless it was a a win or something that they may need. I may not be able to get to them again. I might offer some things that they got to keep an eye on. Yeah. Well, I think that's one of the best opportunities for learning for juniors is because they've just played the match and, and you have a good idea of like what was going well and what maybe, you know, they need to work on. And, uh, you know, I think it's a good time to provide feedback and, and maybe build off of what you've been working on with that athlete. 
Yeah, and tell them that even if uh, all of us coaches, you, you and I and all the guys, because we everybody knows each other now, your generation are the leaders now of the, of the coaching. And when I was there, I, I saw all the other great coaches that were there who I thought were old, but <laughs> now I think like you and Brad are young and some others younger than you and Brad think you're old probably. Uh, probably, yeah. Right? Uh, but we're still both coaching. That's it, yeah. because you love it. it yeah. There's nothing like it to see, you know, to study what uh, what it's about. It's it's not a, a, a elevator ride to the penthouse. There's a well, lot of work. I have a, a a good one here that I know come up comes up at every club uh, with you know not every athlete. But what do you say to a junior or even their parent who complains about a ranking or a particular draw, maybe the seating or who they're playing? Okay, that, that's my pet peeve. <laughs> yeah, I, I always, especially people who are just, you know, they're seven to 15 and they're not, they haven't even been anywhere outside of, uh, let's say they've been playing silver events or they're just playing gold events. Uh, don't talk to me about rankings. I don't want to handle, oh, but Johnny got... 20 points with that win. I said, well, I don't know how the rankings work because I don't, have, it doesn't bother me. Yeah. What, what will happen is if you get better, you'll probably see your ranking go up from September to the end of the summer. Yeah. Right. So don't worry about points. Although some of them <laughs> seem to think they've yeah. undone the code of how to get the points. Uh -uh. You may figure something out, but the best player is going to win, and they're going to. Nobody can get more points than winning all the time. So, yeah, that's a tricky one because you know a lot of you know even college coaches are looking for rankings and stuff like that. So, you know, a lot of parents and the kids might be like feeling a bit of external pressure, be like, oh, if I can get this kind of ranking or ahead of those other kids, I might have a better chance of getting recruited to the school and. You know, you can see how it kind of changes your motivation and, and passion for the game. Chris, someone like you or, or Jack Fairs or stuff, Jack used to call me and ask me what good, you know, players I had. And he was actually, he was looking for the quality of the person. Yeah. Because those guys, I mean, the first two years you're in university, your game's going to go skyrocketing too, no matter how good you were as a, before you get there. Yeah. Because you're more mature, you're working harder, you're stronger, you're probably get, get used to more into the, the off-court preparation yeah. when you're in school. Um, so I, I, I have another question here. Um, so we, we, I think we touched on this just briefly, but I was wondering what area of a junior's game do you feel is most important to develop early? Is there a certain part? Is there a certain swing or certain shots that you think should come first when you're teaching somebody new to squash? Yes, I'm, I'm just trying to think of who gave me this quote at one time. But one of the players uh, that was coaching, it, it, Volley, 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 and when you think you've volleyed enough, volley more. Yeah. Do you like it? It's just a way of because you can always back off volleying, but if you're not a volleyer, you're not going to be able. You're, and it's no longer these two and three hour matches when when you could only score with the serve. So you've got to be a little more aggressive and a lot more aggressive in today's game, I think. But you've got to be able to stay on the court for two hours if you have to. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that's, you know, anytime somebody lifts the ball or, or has it away from the side wall, you have to be able to, you know, put pressure, pressure on them. And, uh, you know, you don't want to do that extra movement to the back of the court if you don't have to as well. Yeah. So that's, a, that's a big part. Um, and I was a tennis player, so I, I was a volleyer in tennis. I wasn't a good one, but I was a, I volleyed. So a, a 
bit of a tricky question here because this is going to go different depending on age and, and skill level, but how long of an off season do you think a junior should have typically from squash? Well, I, I don't mind them playing in the summer, but I, I don't want them, you know, like in, they, they just play to get better for the season to start, but play soccer, play tennis, yeah. Tennis squash combinations are, are quite good in a way. Very good. They, as I said in Montreal, all the best outdoor tennis players were the best squash players at that time. But now there are more people in squash going full tell. So it would be harder for those older players now to maybe dominate. Yeah. Because the younger players are starting earlier and doing better at their squash quicker. Yeah. Um, so uh, how do you deal with a junior who's either very hard on themselves or has a temper? Well, you know, generally that sorts itself out because if they're, ha if they have a temper, they're not enjoying what's happening. I, but I don't want to lose them by just, you know, if they, I'll give them some leeway on how to do it. But if every, for a year, you're crying after every other loss, like you, you, you've got to, you've got to stop. And the, that should be a parent's job too. And I would ask them to talk to your child and either sell, take a break or try another sport. And that calls their bluff because sometimes they don't really want to stop. They want to win. Yeah. And if they want to win, that means they've got to work harder at their game in the right way. And crying, I, I, I would say to people, if you lose a match, somebody told me this, they would say, go into the washroom, shut the door, flush the toilet, cry, and come on out. Don't do it in the front of the court. Is okay, just, not... just a couple more uh, quick questions here for you, Rob. Um, so if, if a parent or a junior was looking for a coach, what qualities uh, in a coach do you think that they should look for? Well, I, I find generally if they're looking for one, if they're, and they probably have a club, they should maybe take their kids into some of the, you know, just general group things and see how they've just got to hit it off with them. And they, each coach might be very good and could get them to where they want. But, uh, and, it, and it, you'll see so many coaches around. Like I always said to people that when I saw you coaching someone, I say, you're going to have trouble with this player because Chris is a great coach and that means you're in for a match. You always seem to have your player, you know, it looked to me like they really wanted to play well and they also wanted to represent your, your style and you were not a whiner. You weren't uh, Maybe did you ever cry on that? Uh, you know, I don't know. I'd have to ask my dad for that one. Uh, I did not like losing one. I mean, I no. still don't, but I handle it a lot better. Uh, yeah, we all could have a few tears when yeah. we play. But yeah. when you're an adult and you play in the age groups, you don't cry. No, no. no. <laughs> well, that's just you, forward. You it to drinks, I think that's why. Yeah. <laughs> I, I should play more than once a week. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, so I was just uh, a couple of kind of quick uh, questions just to finish here. So, what do you think is the most underrated shot in squash? I think I'm not sure it's underrated, but certainly with Jonathan's arrival and and that that the idea of bringing that ball short and by getting on the ball so quickly so that, that you can get this beat of That's just disturbing, right? That's not a, you know, it's not the old softball game where it's down the wall. 
Now, you've got to be able to do that because if the other guy's good with this short game too, you can't expose the court. Yeah. But I, I really think now it's a more exciting game. And we had people like, we've had Gary, we've had Graham, we've had um, Jonathan, uh, down, and we've had all those matches in Toronto where our players were playing the best. And uh, it's just so impressive to see it when you've not even, let's say, know them, but they're Ontarians or they're Canadians. You've got a lot of now role examples. Yeah. So do you have a favorite uh, drill to either do or to watch players do or to do with a junior? Yeah, I, I, I do because I learned it in Philadelphia. It was Bill Lane, who was at Marion Cricket. I grew up, grew up near there, but I didn't belong to Marion Cricket, so I couldn't play squash. But uh, it's called the shoe drill. And it's a length, you could do length drops, you could put four shoes on a court, two to good length, two to front court. And Bill Lane said to me, if you ever want to get kids to keep just loving the game, you double your points if you hit the drop into the shoe. You would get three points if you put it in the shoe, two if you hit the shoe. And if uh, you just won the point, you get your one point. And same with the back court shoe because not it's like golf when you play golf you which you're a good golfer and you were involved in golf uh there's nothing more fascinating than see that putt roll into the cup oh i remember doing that shoe drill many times did <laughs> you like it yeah I've, I've done that with some of my kids too so i still remember you like that. it right Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah. You and I were pretty much, uh, we weren't a big talker, but I love to see, and it's so easy, really. Yeah. At yeah. your level, you could probably hit a ball for two minutes and put, you'll put the hit the shoe or get it in the shoe, probably half your shots or more than half. Depends it's just on the size. <laughs> it's like rolling in 10 foot putts and the putting green for warm up. Yeah. You get your rhythm, you roll it in. You just roll it in. Speaking of golf, uh, Rob, how is your golf game these days? Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'm, because I now doing a lot more work off the court because I've lost some of my strength. And on the golf, I had the yips, but I've, I've achieved that. Robin Kingsmill helped me with that. <laughs> right. well i look forward to seeing it hopefully uh, there'll be a squash ontario golf event next summer hopefully i know we, um so uh, i i guess you the final question is like i haven't decided if i should call this either serious squash pod which is like the name of my company or if i should call it squash talk so i did like a poll on instagram and it was basically split 50 50 so you're the deciding vote if i should call it squash talk or if i should call it like the serious squash podcast well, Chris, I'll tell you, you are one of my favorite guys because, I mean, getting older, I talk more because I just, I just love what I'm talking about. But when I was your age, I was not a talker. And when you were younger, you weren't a big talker. Yeah. You were pretty much, uh, but you would talk. But I mean, I'd say you should name it because you're one of the leaders in the squash world now, and you you pick. Oh, you, too much, you too pick. much pressure on you there, Rob. Is that it? No, no. <laughs> but I think you should do it because okay. you're you're the guy that knows and loves to coach. Yeah. I feel you're very much like me. You're with your student when you're there. Yeah. You're not uh, rolling your eyes, or even if they're struggling, you're not looking to act like what time is it you you wait till all your people are finished you know you don't go to the bar too early and, and you don't right. stay too late yeah. well i think that's part of you know growing up in that environment in pine valley and you know there were so many uh, great families and kids and it, it was so welcoming for a junior to be a part of and uh, you know that's a kind of community that you know i want to create or and I think even just kind of doing this little, these interviews and trying to pick the brains of a bunch of different coaches, like it'll make, you know, 
you know, me a better coach, but it also hopefully make, you know, other coaches who are upcoming or maybe even, you know, you might listen to, you know, maybe I interview some other top coach and you learn some, just one or two little nuggets. I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. I never thought of it like that. And um, yeah, hopefully it'll be useful information, even though I know it's a kind of a niche market. So, yeah, but I think that's something that should happen. That's where look at all the big sports. They're always interviewing coaches or, or people with new ideas. And uh, I think I would watch. Yeah. Well, you'll have to get, learn how to uh, listen to a podcast if you want to listen I, to them. That's the problem. Well, I've started, it, but uh, Ian has to set me up. But eventually, I've got to learn how to do it. <laughs> well, I'm sure I'll have you on the uh, podcast again sometime, Rob. Um, but you were, the, you were the first person. So definitely the, the first person that came to mind when I wanted to do this kind of an interview. And I think the, the best uh, knowledge and experience and a good level head to deal with a variety of parents and kids and programs. So I think uh, a lot of people will find this really interesting and, and I'm sure sometime down the line, we'll do a, a second one. So well, Chris, I thank you for giving me the opportunity and leading me through it because I sometimes lose a train of thought, but I'll tell you, my squash world has all happened in Canada and I, yeah. Everybody, I love going to the big, like the Canadian tournaments, and it's just all these are the people that you love to just be around them in squash. Yeah, I mean, you're I, now I, one of them who's yeah. getting, you know, into that age group I was when you knew me, and uh, it's just a delight. And the squash, all the, all, look at our you know all the people now that are the main coaches in clubs and stuff you know them yeah because there's a transition we're getting older and and on our you know it's a, it's not our turn now to be the leaders it's our turn to learn and just enjoy what we continue to enjoy and get a younger person to do the the, the hard work in there well that that might be true, but I still think that there's a lot of uh, knowledge that, you know, people from my generation or even earlier, you know, can benefit from if that information was available. So hopefully we accomplished at least a little bit of that today. And uh, yeah, I, it definitely brought back a lot of memories to me being a kid at, at Pine Valley. And I'm sure, uh, you know, all the other juniors uh, who are still in the squash world that listen to this, that'll that'll do the same for them. So thanks, thanks a lot, Rob. Thanks, and, uh, Thank you. I'll uh, I'll just hit stop record and then I'll talk to you. So. <laughs>